everybody. Welcome to the Trading Rolling Show for your Thursday edition. I tell you what, this has been like the, uh, the the craziest couple of weeks with regards to speed of how time has been flying. Anyway, welcome to the show. It's the 16th of December. Again, for those of you who are new, hit that subscribe button. You can always contact me at TraderMerlin at gmail.com with comments, questions, topics you want me to cover here on the show. As you may have figured out, we do the show. I try to do it every day, Monday through Friday, although over Christmas and New Year's, we might see some shows drop as I'll be traveling and hopefully enjoying some life. So, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Good to see you. Um, Les asks, am I in the new studio? No, not in the new studio. I have a ton of work to do. I'm not replacing the... <laughs> am I replacing my production team? I don't have a production team. I am the production team. So I, I got some new cameras, I got uh, some new lights, and I have a, um, another room I'm going to be moving to that's considerably larger and allows me to do uh, much more stuff. So it's actually twofold. So just so you guys know, obviously I am um, one of the director of content production for Online Trading Academy and running their crypto program. So what I want to be doing is on behalf of Online Trading Academy, I'm setting up a studio so I can not only do this show every day on my own, which is part of me, my program, um, but also for Online Trading Academy, I want to be able to issue videos like immediately, right away. And obviously because of the FTC issues over the past couple of years, there's been kind of some some fear of releasing things without going through compliance. And as I've seen, going through compliance departments can take days, if not a week or two, depending on how booked people are. So. We're kind of coming out of that. Plus, there's also the trust factor that I'm not the guy who's out there going, you're going to make millions of dollars, just buy a class. You know, that that's we'll never make that kind of claim. So um, they're giving me a little bit of autonomy to if I see something happen um, and, and something in the markets that predominantly with crypto, but if I see something that is noteworthy needs to be addressed right now, I can shoot that video, produce it, edit, output, and upload within a period of just a couple of minutes all on my own. So <clears throat> it's really... Uh, uh, kind of help by Online Trading Academy to get that that effort rolling and I'll be using some uh, much nicer equipment, which is great. So I'm very excited about that. It's just you got to set everything up and make sure that there's no problems. You know, uh, you guys might remember when I started this show back in 2020, I think we started like last week of February or maybe even March 1st of 2020 with this program. You know, I, I, I was doing it with an old computer. I was doing it with a weird internet connection. So I had to make some real quick upgrades to the system and make sure everything ran good for you guys. Now, so far, I haven't seen too many issues. Um, I had a couple little internet outages, but other than that, that's it. So yeah, I'll let you know how it goes. You are my compliance department. Well, you know, I've been doing it long enough. And when you are in this industry long enough, and I think a lot of you are in this industry as well, you realize how many scam artists, uh, how many shysters, how many scumbags there are, and they will say anything. I mean, there's this guy who's got commercials of him flying around in private jets, and he's bragging about how he made $10 million on one trade, you know, and he gets off the plane, and there's a, a, an army of Lamborghinis there. He's like, these are my Lamborghinis. I call bullshit. I'm pretty sure that that guy rented that plane, hired a production team, rented all those cars. He probably drives a Honda Accord. No offense to those people who drive Honda Accords. I drive a Toyota. But... Um, to me, you know, that whole that whole industry is just nothing but scammers out there. I mean, even the Bitcoin conference where in cryptocurrencies, when you do really well, they say, oh, you, you Lambo. It's that point where you buy a Lamborghini. And they were saying that the, the rentals for Lamborghinis like in the state of Florida were all gone because people were just flying in, renting a Lambo and pretending like they're rich. Stop pretending you're rich. Pretend you're humble and just be rich. Ugh, that drives me crazy. Anyway. You've been doing this since 2020. Um, well, Lisa, I've been doing this show, which is totally independent from Online Trading Academy, which is why I can curse, which is why I can say all kinds of things. I try not to because I know some people find it very offensive. I'll keep it PG. You know, I, I say the word shitcoin every now and again or something like that, but uh, I try to not drop the F-bombs, that's for sure. Um, but this has nothing to do with Online Trading Academy. Uh, I ran their show for 10 years, so I did Power Trading Radio for 10 years, so... Uh, got kind of used to it and, and shout out to Gary who produced that show he actually sent me a uh, a video of the first episode that we did back in 2010 oh man that was embarrassing uh, I look like a, an eight-year-old kid anyway if you have to flaunt it you ain't got it I agree John uh, I agree you know and I have I have a couple personal close friends that their whole thing is I have to flaunt it, I have to show off, I have to brag, and look at me and my gold and all this flashy stuff. I don't even have a tan line from any rings or nothing, man. I am, eh, anyway. <coughs> Big, yeah, power trading radio was great, but half hour was too short. Uh, well, that show went for an hour too. Uh, although that, you know, that was very stay within the rails. Here I like it because uh, 
I have much more engagement, I think, and I think it's much more open and, and honest. Not that it wasn't honest before, but um, anyway, let's get gone with it. So here's the uh, the topic for today: how to deal with market volatility. Again, I'm going to look at a lot of different markets. There were some great moves today. Uh, if anybody was in my uh, Crypto Investor Live program today, that was pretty funny too. Uh, we ended up putting an order out to buy some Avalanche on a five to one leverage futures product. Had an entry stop loss in in a minute. It was just all of a sudden spiked down, hit that stop loss, and has just been rocking to the upside ever since. Oh, the beauty. No bling, Margaret. Not for me. No, absolutely not. I'd rather take, if I'm going to spend $10,000 on a watch, I'd rather take that $10,000 and invest it in Bitcoin or, or some other investment where I can make money off of it. So anyway. All right. So, uh, and thanks, Ann. Uh, Anna, I'm, I, you're the reason I, you're, you're the on I joined it. I think I say you're the reason. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, and I will be with Online Trading Academy for a long time. All right, here's the, anyway, the show. How to deal with market volatility. This was brought up from a question by Tim. It says, how, these markets drive me crazy. Up one day, down the next, all-time highs, rising rates, or raising rates. Uh, how do you deal with the stress? <sighs> well, you know, as, as you guys have, I've told you before, I actually have physical ailments from the stress of trading. And I will detail that much more in the White Elephant book, which I know you guys have been pushing me to write. Maybe my uh, my New Year's resolution will be to finish that damn book. Um, how do you deal with it? Uh, you just have to understand what's happening and and when that volatility will be higher. Like right now, it's no um, surprise that our markets right now are very volatile. We have all time highs. We got crazy push to the upside. So much money coming in. Then all of a sudden, you have uh, the Fed basically raising rates. Uh, they haven't done it, but they're going to. You had last night the UK is raising rates. So we we've been in this market environment where that gas pedal has been floored for so long. You know that if they keep it there forever, that engine's going to blow. So there comes a point where you just anticipate more volatility. Now yesterday was a good example. So for example, let's go back. Here's a Nasdaq. Let's drop this down to let's say I don't know 15 minute time frame. You know, you had a weak market, and then you had Jerome Powell not only um, make comments about tapering, but also about rates in 2022. And not only that, he he was really aggressive about it, right? He's doubling the amount of tapering from 15 billion a month to 30 billion dollars a month, which would pretty much get us out of our taper cycle taper cycle by March. And then from there, he said, you know, you look at the dot plot; they're talking about three rate increases, and the market rallies. Right, you gotta just go. Wait a minute. What, 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 what the hell are you talking about? How does the market rally when basically the the guy who's in charge of all the money says we're gonna start tightening up? Where the the fuel, the gas that's been poured on this market for the past nine or sorry, uh, twelve years, we're gonna now stop pouring that on there, and we're gonna actually start pouring water on the fire. That should do what to the markets? It should have a downward impact. So you get these knee jerk reactions like yesterday, which is this huge spike up, and then today markets woke up and went, what the hell are we doing? This is going to start to hurt the markets and all of a sudden gave it all back today and we are right where we were yesterday. Um, I think if we go to 1 p.m., we go to 1. Yeah, you're pretty much right where we were yesterday uh, on the close or the day before yesterday on the close. So, you know, it, it, this is to be expected. So how do you deal with it, Tim? It's actually pretty simple. And I, I've, I've mentioned this. I won't go too long on this one. Um, but we've talked about this in psychology. And there's actually, I think I have a bunch of videos that are deal with psychology on the Trader Merlin page. But bottom line is, if you are winging it, if you're sitting there and you wake up every day and you go, okay, I'll just see what the market does, you're going to be stressed out. Because yesterday, you probably took things home thinking we're on a huge market rally, right? Here is the, the end of day yesterday. So I'll, I'll modify this chart and move it over to where... We closed at, all right? So uh, I have this on East, I have this on, I think I have this on Pacific time. What, what time is it? Oh, it's on UTC. Get me out of there. Who uses UTC? Yeah, okay, I'm on, I'm on never mind. UTC Monday. So I'm on LA time, which means the market's closed right about there. A lot of people took this market home, uh, took positions home because we were ripping, right? Oh, it's optimistic. And then all of a sudden, you have the after hour session, and then we open up here and markets start tanking. A lot of people are going to get caught off guard with that. So, you know, for me, what's your plan, right? If you're buy, if you're buying and holding things, and you think it's just going to keep on going, you got to look at the the big picture. The big picture is these markets are going to face some serious increased headwinds, massive headwinds with regards to tapering and then rates being increased going forward. Now, that doesn't mean the Fed's not going to back the markets anymore. They certainly could. But it just means we got to be ready for it. So, if you're not comfortable with that kind of volatility and indecision that's going to happen in the marketplace. You know, look at the NASDAQ here. The last month and a half has been a lot of indecision. 
There's no clear direction here. I mean, this is Whipsaw City. Um, yeah, I saw the comment from Big Ev. I, I, I'll, I'll actually show it to everybody. I thought this was really funny. Uh, I'm a dork. I'm not a social media person whatsoever, but um, I posted this one. By the way, this if you didn't see this one, this is what it's all about right here. This guy right here is, to me, he should be first ballot Hall of Famer. He's the greatest shooter ever, but his speech that he gives right here is so good. He's so humble. Anyway, um, this is it. I said this is the official clothing accessory for the FOMC announcements, which is this giant neck brace. And for anybody who's you know trading today, you, you kind of probably felt that one. I thought it was rather humorous. Um, so, you know, I, I have a plan. So as I'm going through here and I'm looking at opportunities in the marketplace, I can be wrong, and I'm okay with that. But if I have a plan, I'll be okay. If I don't have a plan, then I'm going to be stressed out. I'm going to be frustrated. You know, the, the trade we made today on AVAX, not that it's a parallel to uh, the equity markets, but let's go to Avalanche. All right. And I'll go down to a five because we were trying to do some day trades for the group in there on a five minute bait. Oh, man, look at this thing. Um, we were buying uh, basically this little demand zone down here and I had my stop loss and it just came out. I'm literally the last trade. It literally got me to the dead low. The last, the 101.32 is the lowest it got, and that was my order got filled. And then literally, the second it filled me, it did this type of thing. Am I upset about it? No. It was my plan. No, I was okay being stopped out. It's frustrating that it, it did what I thought it was going to do right after I got stopped out. But, you know, if I didn't have a plan, then I'd be all emotional and bouncing all over the place, frustrated or excited, whatever. When you have a plan in place, you remove all that stuff. And not remove it, you you limit the damage and that stress that you're dealing with. So Tim and others that are frustrated with all this, I would say, hey, every time you have a trade on, whether it's a short term or a longer term broad market trade, what's your plan, right? And if you are stressed out, you can always cut back the amount of shares, the amount of contracts, the amount of lots, the amount of tokens, just scale back down to a point where you're comfortable. Again, I always talk about this one, everybody wants to be making money in the markets, but when you have a market that's extremely volatile, you don't get good runners. You know, um, I'd like to have Bob Dunn on the program. Maybe I'll ask him if he wants to come on because I'm pretty sure Bob's struggling right now. Why? Because Bob's looking at this picture. This is Bob's picture. What's happened over the past month and a half? There's not a lot of clear direction. Bob does great when a chart looks like that. That's a great chart for Bob. Man, he's killing it. But when it does this and starts just floundering, Again, your style has to adapt to market conditions. Right now, this is just chop and gross. And I mean, unless you're a short-term trader, this is purgatory because you're not getting a clear trend. Um, I've always mentioned this for you guys, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've taken it to heart, which is that, that phrase that says, everything works until it doesn't. And if you're a trend trader, everything was going great in the S&P until a couple weeks ago. Now, all of a sudden, it's just going sideways, and your trend strategy is not working. So if you're a buy and hold investor, you haven't made or lost anything. If you're a shorter term person, you've got great opportunities. I mean, today was probably one of the best just straight sell-offs you've seen in quite a while. All right, look at this five minute chart of today. That was just gorgeous. Just sell off, sell off. It started late last night, but it's just a continuation of weakness, 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 weakness. And I, I think that you know anybody has to take their style and adapt it. So right now I'm scaling back uh, on my trades. I'm not taking, I'm not putting my, committing myself to any big positions except my silver. I'm still got a sizable position in silver. But other than that, I'm not taking big positions here because I want to let this show its hand. Now, I've got that yellow box up there at the top uh, for the S&P. I could broaden that. And really, if I want to be cautious, I could say, look, I'm not doing anything until it gets out of this range. Now, I, I, I'm not going to say that because that's a lot of room between 4750 and uh, 4500. It's 250 points. There's tremendous opportunity here. So um, I'm not going to sit idly, but I think if you're looking for the big trades, if you want the big money trades, you're waiting for a break above 4750 or a break below 4500. And the odds are that you're going to have a bigger move below 4500 because there's not a lot of um, not a lot of gas left to push this aggressively above 47.50, all right? That, that's my take on it. Oh, we got all kinds of stuff. Um, Naum says, I feel stressed in my, when I feel stressed in my gut, so I drink kombucha. Ugh, ugh. Oh God, I can't stand that stuff. I'm, I'm off the list. Um, what happened to the term baked in related to prices from Lisa? I mean, the markets in my opinion are just a reflection of consumer expectations, sentiment, right? So I do think that some of it was baked in. 
the reason I was really expecting there to be more sell-off, certainly today's action is no surprise to me. I think you'll actually see that continue. I think you're going to have a sell-off going into the weekend is what was baked in, right? Baked in was the tapering side of things. That There was a definite assumption they were going to start to taper a little bit sooner. The outside the box thinking was that we were going to have, because the Fed kind of telegraphed one rate increase for 2022. Then they came out and said, well, you know, the thinking was maybe two. Now there's people actually expecting four. Only one person said four. But uh, the majority of people on the FOMC voting team were basically saying three rate increases for 2022. That to me is the outlier, and that should have caused some more negativity in the market, showing that there's going to be an aggressive rate increase in 2022, which for all intents and purposes does what? <laughs> going to slam those brakes on or at least start putting the foot on the brakes for the markets and the economy. So again, I've, I've mentioned this over and over again until I'm blue in the face and you guys are probably sick of it is it's that point where they back themselves in a corner and now they're damned if they try to fight growth or try to stimulate growth or they're damned if they try to fight inflation. Either way, they're kind of in trouble. So it's going to be exciting. There's going to be great opportunities. So, Tim, don't stress. Just put a plan in place and wait for things to follow to your plan. If they don't do what you think they're going to do, then don't make trades, right? Let the markets come to you. Um, if you go, you know, just jump into the river trying to catch fish, you'll scare them all away. Sit there on the banks, cast your hook, and hopefully you'll catch something that's going to do you, do you well. But there's really not much reason to stress other than it's unpredictable sometimes. It's nerve-wracking watching you know a two percent up move yesterday and all of a sudden a two percent down move today i mean nasdaq down two and a half percent today it's like oh no my gosh it's what a horrible day well it was up two and a half percent yesterday so who cares right it's all the same balance is out as jerry seinfeld would say i'm even steven uh will jim kramer switch and become bearish on today's show uh no he won't the main reason is jim kramer is a puppet for the financial industry so he very i don't think i've ever actually seen him be a short kind of guy now, granted, I have heard him say that he doesn't like certain stocks, but to actually go out there and say, short the market, I don't think Jim Cramer will do that. Um, again, that's one of the reasons I got kicked off CNBC is I was saying, short the market in 2008. I'm like, you know, if it breaks this level, short the market, we're going down in a big way. Jim Cramer has too much advertising, too many people paying him to keep the market up, right? JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, these guys all make money if markets keep going up. If it crashes, you know, Consumers get scared. They pull their assets out. They don't trade as much. They sell their holdings, and all of a sudden, Goldman doesn't make as much money. So um, he is a puppet for the financial industry. Uh, let's see. Mark Ross said, so basically, the Holy Powell's pep talk was just foreplay for today's sell. Um, you know, Mark, I, I don't know. That was an interesting one because I did not I did not see, for, especially once I saw the press conference live, I was watching the press conference live, and it, the market just kept going up. I'm like, Man, are people not understanding what he's saying here? They're really saying that this market is, it's cooked. It's done. They're not going to let it continue to spike like this because inflation is too much of a threat. And that's what they were telegraphing by doubling the speed of tapering as well as saying rates are going to increase. So we'll see what happens. My bias is definitely to the short side. Again, uh, there was only trade I made today was in crypto and, and, and that was not that big of a deal. But um, who knows? When is Santa Claus rally going to begin? Monday? <laughs> Supposed to be the last, uh, I think the last eight or 11 days of the year is the typical Santa Claus rally. Who knows? Uh, we may get coal in our stockings this year for the Santa Claus rally. So Tim, uh, that's it. You got to just relax. If, if it's stressing you out too much, then don't trade. Of course, for if you're like me, not trading stresses you out. I feel like I got to be in there stressing out. Uh, and he says, yeah, in the classroom at OTA Detroit. Well, shout out to OTA Detroit right now. That's awesome. Good to see we got some physical classrooms back up and running. Of course, we go, maybe I should wear my mask for the show today because I'm in California. I, you know, the way it works out there. Um, let's see. What else we got? Uh, what happened? I turned big. Dang, got that one. Um, <laughs> the market makers and the media know how to create fear. And I think that's something that we all agree upon, um, regardless of our political or religious differences. I think we all agree that the media does a tremendous job of creating fear. If they didn't have fear out there, they wouldn't be able to get people to tune into the newscast. Uh, what else do I got? Yeah, Tom, that's a good point. You know, when you start to get too microscopic, you freak out, right? When you look at something so detailed and you see small little actions, like, oh my God, it's crazy. Zoom out. Look at the bigger time frame, you know? Uh, and that's a great example. So let me look here. If you look at the, the five minute of what we had over the last couple of days, 
I mean, this is this is crazy. This is just crazy whipsaw action, right? Well, this is what happens during a Fed announcement. I mean, how many times have you guys heard me say, don't trade the Fed announcement? Too much volatility and unpredictability. Kind of like earnings, right? You just don't know what's going to happen. Well, if you go to the daily, now all of a sudden, that's no need to freak out. We're we're definitely smacking our head against the ceiling. But again, I said this over, over and over the past couple weeks. We're not done. We're not done until we start making some new lows, and we haven't made new lows, right? 4,500 on the S&P, that's the new low. If we break that, then we start building some short positions, and I'll tell you exactly what my positions are as we do that. Um, let's see, what was the other? There was another question asking about the NQ. I'll give some props to uh, that one. Who uh, asked about the NQ? Where was it? Oh, it's way back here. Well, somebody asked uh, about the levels on the NQ. Oh, that was for Margaret, uh, target for the NQ. You know, right now, um, you can see I've got this line at 15.4, right? 15,400 is the point where I think it's going to head to. I think you'll probably see that by the end of next week. So just because um, people like to call me out and say things about me, let's go uh, target. And what's the end of next week? So this is uh, tomorrow. Today's a, tomorrow's 6, 14th, which means it's going to be the 24th. Christmas Eve is, is on a Friday? Wow. Um, so we'll go 12, 24. I think we'll be there by 12, 24. So let's just put that right there. We'll watch that one next week. Um, I'm not going to be doing a show. I don't think I'm doing a show Thursday, Friday. I have to look at my calendar, but I'm going to be uh, traveling. So, um, you know, I'm not, not sure. But I'll just leave that right there. That's my, my target. Um, let me ask you, Margaret, what's your target? It would be fun to do. Like, I wish I had the time. It would be great to actually do a chart where we can put all of our uh, thoughts on where the market would be on a specific date. Maybe maybe once I maybe I can finally get some sponsorship and be like okay give a give a tenth of an ounce gold coin or a fraction of a bitcoin to whoever gets the closest call for where uh, the you know the markets will be at the end of the month we'll do a once a month drawing it'll be kind of fun. No, why did the market skyrocket yesterday? Because they had clarity, right? I think that the big thing is uncertainty. Markets hate it. So even though in my opinion yesterday's news is not good for the markets overall in the long term, uh, let me let me take that back is not good for the equity markets, right? Tapering aggressively and potentially raising rates in 2022 is bad for the stock market, period. But at least the stock market now has an understanding and they've kind of pushed that back till the next meeting, which can happen in, in 2022, that they know where the Fed stands right now and they'll trade according to that. So I think it was really a relief rally that they finally had all this misconception and assumptions cleared up with the Fed, their rate statement and the conference afterwards. Target is like a football pool. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Let's, let's do it. Let me see. Maybe uh, I'm not gonna do it on my own pocket. Well, but maybe. Oh, who knows? Maybe. maybe we'll do a tenth of an ounce of gold coin, and we'll just send it out to whoever gets the closest at the end of the month. Um, what else do I have in your mind? Uh, okay. I think the reference to Detroit OTA was about. Oh, oh man. That picture, I actually, it's funny because as they took down some of the, uh, the centers, they closed the Seattle office, which was unfortunate. Seattle was such a great office and just really great people up there. Um, there's one of those pictures floating around. I thought about actually bringing it and putting it in my house, but how, what's your ego if you have a picture of yourself on a big trading floor? But I don't know. Anyway, yes, that picture was taken in 1998. Uh, I think it was in December or something of 1998. Kind of a fun picture. I looked so young in that picture. Oh my God, it's crazy. Um, yes, right, Big Gab? We'll talk about that as well today. Metals, love it. Um, I know some of you guys bought silver yesterday. Awesome. That $20 point was a great spot to buy if you're thinking long term. Again, I was going to buy some more, but my position's already pretty sizable in silver, and I don't want to uh, load it up anymore, but uh, it's pretty good. All right. True. Admiring the Fed's transparency is like a bug admiring a windshield transparency. Yeah. I mean, I actually prefer the, the Greenspan days where you just didn't know and all of a sudden it just punched you in the face like, oh, wow, I got to deal with this right now. That, that was more fun. Um, nowadays, I think it's a little bit too scripted, but it, I don't know. All right, let me go down this list. So uh, this is uh, could be a very complex question. I'm going to keep it very simple for John. He says, I'd like to start selling cash covered puts and covered calls in addition to the SPX trades. Is $4,000 account big enough to do this? I, I The verticals, he does verticals right now. Uh, verticals only require 500 bucks per trade, but is the extra 3,000 to 3,500 enough to realistically allow me to sell a put once every few weeks? If not, what would you suggest the minimum be? Well, it really is um, important that you understand that it's not, you can't really say is X amount of dollars enough. It's what are you trading, right? So for example, remember every options contract controls 
100 shares, right? So if I go out here and I want to trade SPY, and you do a cash, you're selling puts, a cash like your put, basically, right now it's 466 bucks. So 100 shares, that would be $46,645 that you would need in your account to cover that option. So clearly 4,000 wouldn't cut it. But if I went to something like SLV, right, silver, right now trading at $20.79, I could buy, or I could sell one put on SLV, and that would cost me $20.79 if I did it at the market. Let's say I decided to do the, um, the $20, right? So let me move this line down here because that's what the next logical strike price would be. If I sold the $20 strike, which is right, come on, Merlin, there, close enough, um, then that would cost me 2,000, right? Because it's whatever the, the strike price that you're selling the put at times 100. So sure, you could. Now, granted with silver, there's not a lot of meat on that bone. I mean, you're not gonna get great um, yield on silver. Usually, if you go out 75 cents to a dollar over the course of a month, you'll get probably 1%, but it depends on volatility and market behavior. Now, why is that important? Well, if you look at these ETFs here, right? Here's financials, energy, um, you got materials, healthcare, util all kinds of stuff in here, right? Notice the prices of these. None of them are under 39 bucks, which means you're gonna need more capital. And that's just to do one put option, right? Because if I want to do one of XLF, it's going to cost me roughly $3,900, depending on the strike price, to sell one put. So your answer, John, is you're not going to have enough to do um, cash covered puts, cash secured puts. Unfortunately, it just it won't work that way. It won't work in your account. But you know, if you're doing verticals, why not instead of doing one, why don't you spread it around and do multiples, and do a couple different um, vertical spreads. Um, in different assets, right? Because you, you're gonna have 500 bucks per trade is what you're saying. Well, you have enough to do four or five different ones, right? All right, let's see. Um, I'm in Valby, Washington. Yeah, I know, I know, me too. Uh, I actually taught at the center multiple times and every time, uh, even though you guys have the worst football team on the planet, what a bunch of losers on that, I'm, I'm kidding. As, as you guys may know, there's only one team that matters. Oh, there they are, the San Francisco 49ers. Anyway, you know who we don't like, though? This is for you, Tom. Yeah, take your Dodgers. Did you guys win the World Series, by the way? I oh, that's right. You choked again on the Dodgers. Okay. Anyway, enough of my sports and heckling my uh, fan base out there. Anyway, Merlin, uh, have you ever traded any of the CME weather products? I have not. I've, I've not traded them at all. I'll look at them, or maybe I'll reach out to somebody that I know uh, who does. Uh, granted, I haven't really... Uh, you're not going to show my reply to your tweet? Oh. <laughs> okay, fine, I will. <laughs> so it was actually a great reply. So here's here's the uh, the tweet that I did, right, with the neck brace one. And then if I look at uh, the replies, there's Daniels. <laughs> People, what happened? Me. <laughs> I love it. I love that one. Oh, that's so good. All right, anyway, let's get off that. Cool. <clears throat> Uh, was that the San Francisco logo on a hotkey? Yes, I have it set here. It's it's not on a hotkey. I actually have it set. Um, there's layers I use in the in the software I'm using, and I just had happen to have the Dodgers from the World Series and and uh, the 49ers one. Yes, obviously I'm a 49ers fan. Do -do -do. <clears throat> it's been a tough year, but I'm still a Niners fan. Still, you know, slugging through. We have a chance to make the wild card. So, John, there you go. I think if you want to do, um, you know cash geared puts, you need more capital. So, you know, the accounts that I'm doing in it have quite a bit of capital. So I can go out there and I can buy or uh, I can sell multiples of, uh, you know, SPY or QQQ. Those get really expensive. Um, but, you know, you, you can generate a nice yield. It's just not a really aggressive yield, right? I'm not making like 50% per month. It's like I'm shooting for a 1% or more gain per month in the portfolio by selling cash, um, cash geared puts, simple. Uh, let's see. Oh, anti-NorCal. Damn it. All right, Mike. I think you might actually be with us here today. Mike says, would you take a look at X on mobile, the old XOM, and uh, to what levels to pay attention to? I see it rolling over, but if SPY and oil rally may not work out. Well, let's take a peek at that one. That was actually from yesterday, so we might be a little bit delayed here. If you look at it, 
it's still an uptrend, right? Now, granted, you have that big sell-off that from where we were way, way back when. Here's your, let's start in the long term, right? Let's, let's pull the bob done. I want to go to the monthly, check on my time frame. There's your long-term time frame, right? So it, it, it looks to me that if you look back here, let me put a, uh, let's just torture you with the yellow box. If you look from here, right, that big yellow vertical line, that was the peak, clearly. If you can't figure that one out, you need some glasses. Um, but from that point, and that is really all the way back into 2014, we did what? We nothing but sell off. I mean, you sold off for seven years straight on ExxonMobil, from 2014 all the way down to October of 2020. Now, of course, we did have the, you know, the, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the aggressive sell-off there with COVID as it hit everything. You know, the question is, is ExxonMobil going to come back? Well, um, I don't know. We'll zoom in. Let's go from the monthly to the weekly. It actually is looking stronger. So, you know, you thought it was rolling over. It's rolling over on maybe the daily or a four-hour time frame, but are we making higher highs and higher lows? Yes, we still are. So, we'll go to the daily again. And now the question is, well, where's this thing going? Well, um, you know, for me, there's a couple different simple steps. Basically, actually, let me just, let me do this a different way. And you guys know I'm a little bit of a weirdo, but I like the yellow box and I like to do this. If this is the range that I've seen us in most recently, right, that's where we're at. We've, we're up at a peak on ExxonMobil right around 66.40 and you've got your bottom down here right around, call it 59.20. Okay, so we're range bound. Granted, there's plenty of opportunity in there. Are we rolling over inside this yellow box? It appears so, but it doesn't mean we're done. So if we start to close below, call it 50, 59, 15 or something like that, maybe below 59, you've got this big unfilled gap here. And my personal feeling is if we break below that, you're gonna close that gap right away. But it still does look strong. Yesterday you had a great hammer formation. Today it was a nice follow through rally. And, ah, you know, I don't know if it's if it's necessarily rolling over. It's showing a little bit of weakness over the past month, but all in all, it's still trending up, right? Now, we can do comparisons out here, and I think I showed you guys this before where you go out to something like um, stockcharts.com and do a perf chart, right? So let's just real quickly do that just for fun. Stockcharts.com, right at the top, you can put in a perf chart, performance chart, so just to keep it even, we'll go XLE, so we have an energy in there. Then we're gonna go and we'll look at, uh, you want Exxon Mobil, you want Chevron. Uh, X. Okay, I got Chevron, uh, we've thrown some BP, we could throw in, um, let's see, what else do you want in there? I got Exxon Mobil, Chevron, BP, uh, Phillips 66. Is it PSX? I forget the symbol for Philips 66. Yeah, PSX. All right, we'll just do those those five, right? What's nice about the performance chart is we can actually check and see how things have been looking, right? So where do we want to create the anchor from to compare analysis? For me, I would probably do it from this point, right as it started to bounce uh, in October or November 1st of 2020, okay? So I can go here, and now I'm gonna go a little bit further back, and there's your bottom, right? So out of all of these, right now, Philips 66 is the weakest. ExxonMobil is actually up near the top and the strongest. So is it the weak? I don't know. I personally think it's still going. Oh, we could have put USO, but that's not necessarily, I mean, that's the commodity itself. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of doing a comparison between the the companies that are extractors or manufacturers or refiners. Just, just competition, right? USO isn't necessarily competition. But good point. I could put that on there if you want. Um, you, know, you look at it, it still looks real strong to me, even though it's pulling back a little bit, right? It's bound to have a little bit of a pullback. So I'd be a little bit cautious on shorting oil right now. I pretty much, I do think you're going to see oil continue to rally up. I think that inflation is going to cause oil to continue to rally up. And then we'll probably hear OPEC say they're going to increase production and bail everybody out. But right now, um, what levels, just to go back to the initial question here from Mike, which was what levels do you see? Um, pretty easy for me. I put lines across that top, I put lines across the bottom, and I would kind of wait for it to do something outside of those zones. I would be using, kind of call it 59.20 is kind of my uh, buy point. And you know, maybe it's gotten near that top at 66.40. You might want to take some profits off the table, right? But right now, 
I, I don't really see it getting much weaker or getting weaker unless it does. I know it sounds so stupid, but until we start making some new lows, and the real the real kicker is going to be down here below that 52, but that's a long ways away at this point. What happened November 2020? Oh yeah, <laughs> BBB. All right, and I think I had one more question here, and then I can wrap it up. Um, I've covered this one before, Allison, and it's, it's kind of a vague question, but I'm going to ask you guys. You guys get to participate here, so get your fingers all warmed up, you know, stretch them out, do what you got to do. I, I need to, I want to hear, if your microphone's running, I want to hear the cracks of the knuckles as you're getting ready to type. All right, get ready to type. Here's the question. What's the best way to make money when market crashes? That's from Allison. So you guys tell me, I'm curious, before I jump in here, because I have my viewpoints on it, but you know, what's the best way to make money when markets crash? And when we say markets, let's just assume the equity markets, broad markets, you know, obviously if the S&P starts to tank, that's gonna bring pretty much everything down with it. There will always be some stocks that go against the grain, but what is the best way to make money? And go ahead and tell me. You always catch the end, Don. Oh, the only time Don doesn't catch the end of the show is when he finally makes it on the show as a guest. What's up? So, yeah, you guys tell me. What's the best way to make money when markets crash? JM says puts. Buy puts. Yep. Buy puts. Short futures. Okay. Buy out of the money puts. Yeah, and I think... <laughs> I like... Uh, the deep out of the money, right? Like for me, it's not only out of the money, but I go deep. Sell juiced up puts at the bottom. <laughs> um, short and take profits off the table. Okay, good. Bear put back spread. I think you, I don't know if you'll get the greatest rate of return for that one. I think if you just go straight up directional, you get the best rate of return. Um, shorting on the way down, buy puts. Yep. There you go. I, all of those are viable, right? I think I think it's, it's fairly easy. You say, if you could just short the puts or short the futures contract, right? You have a leverage instrument, you can go short the futures contract. Great, that's an easy way to do it. And you don't have any short sale rules, very easy. Um, buying puts is one of the best ways. The problem is if the market's selling off and if we have this situation where, let's go back to, let's go SPY. You know, if we have this situation where this starts to tank and we start breaking some new lows, let's say we get below this 450 mark on SPY, which is the target for me right now, if we get below that, now all of a sudden people are starting to freak out, right? The emotions are gonna spike and all of a sudden everyone's gonna go, I need to buy puts to protect. So at that point, your puts are gonna be really expensive. So one thing um, that I will probably be doing, I'm gonna wait till January just because I, I told myself I'll never short the market in December ever again because of my uh, Best Buy trade, which cost me a nice six figures. Um, I will be buying, I mean, I'm talking deep, deep out of the money puts. Like if I'm looking at SPY, now let me just go over the futures contract because I have some levels drawn on this one. You know, there's our 20% pullback. So in January, I'll probably go and buy uh, probably April's or May, probably closer to May, down here around 38. Like that's that's way out of the money, and the cost is going to be pretty cheap if I buy them soon, because right now, granted, people feel the markets are going to sell out, but the market's so high that the premium's not gonna be that bad. But as soon as we start breaking 4,500 on SPY, these ones will cost a lot more, right? A significant amount more. Uh, this is actually what made my year last year, when you look at 2020 sell-off, we were right here. I can actually tell you the exact day, because it was awesome. I had a guy in my program, and it was, the, I thought the 20, the 18th. So this is the day, three days before this big sell-off, right there. Guys on my show, and we did a special for Power Trading Radio. It says, how do you how do you prepare yourself for a black swan event? And we were talking about it, and he goes, the best way is to go deep out of the money puts because they're super cheap. Therefore, if it starts to fall, you get a real big pop. You go far enough out so time decay, um, if you're buying, if you're buying, you go far enough out so time decay is not that much of an issue. Um, there you go, 458 for next week, okay, mm -hmm, okay. All right, good luck with that. Uh, but you're not thinking it's going to hit that price next week. It's just thinking there's going to be a sharp sell-off and that deep out of the money put uh, value will spike significantly. So, um, you know, this this trade right here, I had 30 or 40 puts and it just cratered. Now, unfortunately, I got out after like five days. I wish I would have held it all the way to 2,200. It would have been a much bigger trade. Oop, I, I'm not showing you the chart. 
um, you can see that big sell-off. I got out after you know five days of this or so, it was a 300% rate of return in that short window of time. Had I held it, I mean, I could have, I don't know what the rate of return would have been, a couple thousand percent on my uh, put options that were so deep out of the money. So that's what I would do. Allison is I would say go deep out of the money give yourself enough time to let those go to come to fruition um, Daniel I love it do the exact opposite of Jim Cramer <laughs> um, oh, okay you sold them there you go yeah you're, you're fine with those if you sold them, I'm just talking buy directionally uh, what would you do if you I'm in an iris so I can't short what do you do for Owen um, depends where your IRA is held so if you are in an IRA, you can buy inverse ETFs. You know, your SH, right? So SH is, is one to one opposite of the S&P 500. You could buy um, SDS, which is double, right? And then there's triple ETFs, which I wouldn't recommend that. But you're not shorting in your IRA. You're buying a security that is short. So in 2008, one of my best trades was I bought long QID and I just rode QID for quite some time and made a great year out of it. I may just make doing this just why instead of weekly. Uh-huh. Yep. Absolutely, Alan. Always check your dates. You know, it's one of those in the cryptocurrency program that I have, I'm always telling people, look, triple check your stuff. When you send orders out, especially for options, because they can be a little bit confusing, with stocks, it's like, okay, I want to buy this stock at this price, here's a limit order, done. With options, you're like, I want to buy, no wait, I want to buy buy or sell okay now is it a put or a call so I have to sell that put now I need a strike price and there's 30 different strike prices which one do I want to pick I'll pick this one why it's a weekly it's a monthly it's a quarterly Oy, it's a bit confusing but always triple check makes it much much easier no problem Owen yeah you in if it's self-directed you can you actually have op the the options no pun you can also use options in those accounts so you could potentially buy puts in an IRA if it is a self-directed IRA it really depends on where it's at I've traded about $65 million in options on stock rebound into the holiday. No. No, I didn't see that. I really, believe it or not, I really try not to follow too much news. It just it just brainwashes me and I try to keep objective and, um, you know, stay out of that crap. All right, let's see. Uh, I can't believe what I've Oh, I haven't checked out. Buy to open or sell to open. Got to start saying that out loud. Yep, exactly. <laughs> It's funny because I'm teaching my dad as well to trade options. He's, uh, you know, I, he, he likes the 1% strategy I taught him. So what you got with Ford? Uh, I can't believe Ford options are letting me down tomorrow a few grand. Bought calls, that is. Well, I mean, why are they letting you, letting you down? Where are we at? Just because you thought it would keep going up, keep going, accelerating? Hmm. All right. Uh, that's it for today, man. I have... Uh, I'm going to have some fun tomorrow on the show. I've been looking forward to having a nice cold glass of whiskey. So I'll do some whiskey on the show tomorrow. I'll, I'll try to switch it up. I've been really kind of loving that Bib and Tucker six year. It was delicious, but I got to mix it up because that bottle's going kind of quick. So anyway, uh, tomorrow's show, you got a topic, let me know. I'm open to whatever you want to discuss. You can email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, I will uh, let you know more about, what was I going to tell you guys about? Oh, the studio. You'll see the studio updates, not tomorrow, but will be um, the upstairs studio will be hopefully finished this weekend fingers crossed and i'll have much better video i won't look red like i look beet red for some reason i think i'm colorblind but i don't know i look like i got sunburn <clears throat> okay cool well all right everybody that's gonna do it for today's show again if you have comments feedback uh good bad or indifferent let me know email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com you can also join the conversation or put comments down below the youtube video that obviously helps with the search engine optimization and who knows might actually put me higher up on some search engines and new people start to watch the show which makes it even more fun that said hope you guys have a fantastic evening i will see you tomorrow not lisa not a weekend it's not friday girl we got one more day Anyway, have a fantastic one, and we'll get Don on. We'll try to get Don on next week, right? Don, Don's heckling me about the markets. Let's go, buddy. Let's have a knockdown, drag out fight. I'm kidding. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll email you, Don. We'll get you on for next week sometime. Anyway, for the rest of you guys, have a fantastic remainder of your day. I will see you tomorrow. Take care.